Are you, are you? Uh, so this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, February 16th, 2023. Um, hey, Mark, you out, out walking? I am. Excellent. Looks like a barn. Oh, it's just a Chevron. Ah, it's just Coffee. a Chevron. Too bad. Too bad that bucolic barns have been replaced by Chevrons. Um, I'm looking for how to turn on the transcript. It's, it keeps moving on me. I don't know why. Show captions. captions. There we go. Thank you. So beautiful transcript. Save. Good. Now that's working. <clears throat> um, hi, everybody. Uh, Doug, is, Doug is back from Malaysia and was just telling me a bit about uh, staying in, in KL for two days and then going up to the, the jungles for four days, I think. Yes. Days, and it sounds like it was magical. Sounds like it was a lovely trip. Well, it was, in, in a way, visiting a wounded part of the, of the world. Um, but people were amazingly healthy. <clears throat> So you, so you saw both signs of stress and signs of health all yes. together, I guess. Yeah. Um, lot, two weeks ago, uh, so Doug, welcome back. I, I would still love to turn to the topic that you had posed in front of us maybe next week, um, although there's a couple of topics sort of uh, that are in front of us that, that we might choose from, but we might do that next week. This is a check-in week. Um, last check-in call two weeks ago, we did the Stacy protocol, um, uh, and uh, uh, the Stacy protocol is in my brain as the Stacy protocol, and uh, I will talk through it. Talk us through it again now, so we're familiar with it. Which is, um, raise your Zoom hand if you are moved to add to the conversation. So you volunteer your way into the queue. I'm not picking the queue. Uh, before speaking, please pause for however long you feel is fit. Uh, the silence helps us process. I will not pass the mic. So uh, it turns out that in Zoom, everybody sees the same queue because as the hands go up, that's the order they wind up in your view in. So if you're next in the queue, please step on in on your own. <clears throat> and then the chat is open season. So um, go ahead and chat away, um, add your comments. And sometimes you can add into the chat what you thought you wanted to say by stepping in to take your turn in check-in. And that's totally cool. And then you'll just check in a little bit later or something like that, or maybe you already checked in. Uh, but that is the way to, um, to proceed through this particular method of operations. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? What was the last yellow thing on your brain list? The last yellow thing on my brain <laughs> list was uh, potential brain drops, which is um, brain drops are basically uh, YouTube shorts that I'm recording. And uh, so I'm, I, I've been doing some of those and the, explaining the Stacy protocol is on my list of potential brain drops. Gotcha. How about that? Mm -hmm. um, Patty, question? I do have a question. Um, I, I haven't been in many of these check-ins. So just curious, uh, when we say check-ins, is it um, what's happening for me personally? Can check-ins include thoughts and curiosities we've been pondering? Um, what is the nature of the check-in, I guess? Um, I think all those qualify. The, the general umbrella is, <clears throat> is OGM-iness, so open global mindedness, which is a pretty broad umbrella. Um, so yeah, cool. I think that'll work out great. And uh, with that, I will go quiet and let the first people go. I think that's me. Um, and I, I actually had a couple meta comments, uh, two two meta comments. One of them is another part of the the Stacy protocol. I think that we came up with last time was that it was uh, okay to go more than once, which is a little bit different than than our usual check-ins. And uh, the other thing is that uh, I was on a um, actually it was the sense doing call with Joanne. Uh, Joanne and I were sharing an iPad to be on Zoom and there was one oddity with the, the hand uh, queue that I, th I think the person you are is always at the top of the queue, it looks like. So you have to kind of watch uh, a little bit carefully. Gil, you're saying not that's not true. I haven't found that, so it may be a- On an iPad? Maybe an iPad specific, I don't know. I, it was I, iPad specific, it's fine. I'm on a computer now and it's not like that, but- 
Mm -hmm. um, the iPad always kept us top left, and it was a little bit confusing to tell where you were in the queue. And Pete, thank you for clarifying. And I think we should also maybe have a Stacy protocol for check-in only and a Stacy protocol for the full call. And the, the check-in only means only go once and then don't, don't repeat. And then the full call means that's that protocol for how we run it. But thank you for differentiating. I have added that to my brain. Yeah, uh, another one was uh, leave your hand up until you're done speaking. Thank you very much. And can we not call it that anymore? <laughs> it, it, I mean, I, I, I'm really honored, but it's enough. Thank you. So we should brainstorm a, a, a different <laughs> thing to call it, maybe. That sounds good. A replacement would be good. How about just S? S. I like the letter S. S. Okay. <laughs> it flows. It's good. You can call it the OGM protocol. Mm -hmm. I, I've already got a collection of three that I've described <laughs> um, in my brain that we've been using in OGM. So we can sort of switch back and forth. There was the Doug protocol, there's my default protocol, and now there's the protocol. Yes. Um, Peter, you complete? And Mr. Trexler, you are on the hoof. Uh, so you can't oh. quite see the same display we see. So I will cue you in, but you figured yeah, that, that out. That's why, that's why I raised my hand right away because I knew that only Pete has hit hand, had his hand raised. So it would be hard for me to lose track of where I was in the order. Um, no, just a very quick thing. I'm reading uh, Greta Thunberg's book, uh, The Climate Book that just came out last week, I think. Um, it's a massive book. It's an audio book of close to 18 hours. Uh, and even though I'm listening it at, at to it at 2.5 speed, it still is a long uh, audio book. But you know, it, it really, from an OGM perspective, it's it's a series of what it sounds like is going to be about a hundred short <laughs> snippet papers um, from you know every conceivable expert on every conceivable uh, topic. And you know, it just it just makes me wonder who is the audience for this thing. I mean, 18 hours of relatively simplistic, you know, a, aimed for a general audience uh, discussions of, of pretty much every topic in a format that no one's going to read. They'll forget everything that was in there pretty much instantaneously. Um, and, it, and it just, you know, it just raises the question again of for a, a problem like climate change, the, the standard methods of communication, the standard methods of sense making, so to speak, to the extent you'd want to try and call it that, just don't work. Uh, and I think I think this book is just a great example of that. Yeah, if I may jump in, <clears throat> short moment of silence here. Um, I mean, basically, we, we have to move on into very practical decision making steps. Um, I mean, there's so many, there's so much information out there. It's just overwhelming. It's paralyzing. You know, the Wall Street Journal had an article yesterday about you know, this ice uh, field there is about to collapse and um, 11 feet of, of water rise. But then they say, you no, know, within the next you know, hundreds of years. Well, no, it's just, this is maybe 30 years, right? 20, 30 years where we will experience this. And so, so the, the, and nothing, there really is going to happen until the general public gets a sense of I could be doing something here. You know, this is how I could engage, and we just don't talk about it. And the reason for that is that you have a corporate structure. I mean, there there are you know, people who who control you know the energy and the food and all of that, and they just don't want to see any change happening that would change and force force change into their business models. And in many cases, whether that's the electric sector or the the food sector, those changes are pretty structural, pretty fundamental. You know, and many of them, I mean, it's the uh, Kodak model. You know, many of them are not going to make it, and 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 are not even trying really. You know, because in order to really, it, it, everyone like General Mills and in my like in my sector, ties, they know exactly what needs to be done. They just don't want to do it. You no, know? and so to get the information translated to the general public, um, that that really is the challenge. And the media systems are simply not, 
not working in in educating the public uh, in in not alarming i mean you need to be alarmed in some way but in a in a constructive way you know where this is uh, actionable i can do something about this here and so we're spinning you know and i've been doing this now for 10 years you know we just keep spinning and and in this group here we're so con aware you know, of where we're heading into but we're still not talking about very uh, realistic steps it's like in this uh, webinar i was hosting on tuesday uh in the chat you know, there was a very uh, lively uh, conversation happening in the in the chat area we have all these immigrants coming from south america many of them are smallholder farms farmers you know why don't we let them have five ten acres of farming and and get into uh, food production on a very hyper local level and repair you know, the 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 damage that has been done to the environment there are so many things we could be doing we just we just don't do it you know? Okay, uh, I'll leap into this void. Um, sometimes should we have a conversation about what happens if we agree that we're not going to make it? Well, we're not going to make it. It's, you know, I mean, I've come to equips with we're not going to make it. It's as clear as can be. <clears throat> Doug, we, I, 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 I'd like to have that conversation, but I'd like, I'm not sure how to have it. So I think designing how to have that conversation is an interesting question too. As usual, I want to know who's we. And what do you mean by not going to make it? You're talking extinction. You're talking collapse of civilization. Uh, you're talking a reduction of human population from eight billion down to one billion. Just curious, what does that mean to say we're not going to make it? Well, that would be part of the discussion. We could start with. Uh the breakdown of um, infrastructure and the supply chains. Well, I, I found myself in a very personal take on it this week. Am I, am I breaking the protocol here? Sorry. I, I'm, I'm on the iPad now, Pete, so I can't, I can't see um, what, what. Patty, Patty's up next. Sorry, Patty. That's okay. No need to apologize. Well, just real quick then. So for, for me that we're not going to make it is, um, is the, what impact is the collapse of the Antarctic ice sheet to have on Bay Area real estate, which is where I live, not far from the water. So it just takes the whole catastrophe, makes it very personal. Mm. Not to the exclusion of the global. There you go. I like the question, Doug. Hmm. Hmm. I appreciate, Doug, I appreciate the question. <clears throat> Gil, I appreciate you presencing um, what's alive in you around Doug's question. And I, I will, I would love to check in. And I think. Perhaps part of that for me is um, I feel like acknowledging the, what I feel is the wisdom in, in Doug's question. You know, what would it look like to have that conversation that I, I've never been a part of that conversation. I haven't witnessed anyone having that conversation. And I think that there is, um, there might be value and wisdom in having the conversation 
that so many have been, at least in my experience, it seems to be so many have just avoided having, we don't go there because we don't know how to have it. Um, I think there, I'm hearing a theme of a lack of per clauses, clauses sharing, uh, perhaps a lack of emotional um, inner resourcing to support one in having that conversation um, or in having the conversation to the degree of identifying where action can and cannot be taken um, in one's personal life. And I think that that sense of, um, and Klaus is sharing, I was hearing the elements of denial, perhaps. Um, if, if I'm not acting, might it be because I, I can't fathom what it would mean to hold that truth and hold that possibility? And do I feel paralyzed? Do I feel um, do I feel paralyzed? And so in Doug's invitation to have that conversation, I, I feel that as an invitation to move forward into um, what for some might be the experience of paralysis and overwhelm. And um, and, and not, not for all, but I, I do feel that's a really um, beautiful invitation. I wouldn't know how to have that conversation. Um, I'd be interested to, to be a part of it and witness it. Um, my coming back to what has been coming up in the chat around reminders of this being a check-in week. I am excited to report that I am leaving the country for the first time uh, in my life. I'm 31 years old. I know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, 31. I'm going to Costa Rica and I am going to be a stone's throw away from the one and only Todd Hoskins and spending some time with, uh, with Todd when I'm out there. Yes. Yes. Thumbs up all around. Um, I'm very excited for that. I'm going to be spending a month there and uh, just thrilled. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think that's my check-in. I feel complete for now. Hi, Judith. Hi. I'll step in just for a moment as moderator to facilitate something. I'm noticing that many of you have probably noticed, which is there's we're we're in a weird limbo state between check-in and full conversation mode, where we're responding to each other. So in check-in, I think the intention is, correct me if I'm wrong, that each of us checks in with what is happening with us, around us, within us, that has to do with our general shared topic. And Per the Doug protocol, there's a check-in round, which then ends at which point we shift into, oh, okay, which of the things presented during check-in would we like to spend the rest of our time together talking about? And then there's a, a, a slightly different protocol for that time. And I think I haven't been very clear about, um, about where we are or whether we're doing that, because it would be nice to do... It would be nice to not be replying to each other here, kind of Quaker meeting style, where messages don't answer other messages, but rather let everybody check in and we're not that big a group, and then go and then keep notes to yourself and then go into the general discussion. That that feels like an interest, like a slightly more structured use of our time and maybe the way to to go for this one. Uh, I've got some some finger wiggles on that. Uh, so why don't we treat this as check in for now, and then once. Once everybody's kind of uh, had their turn, we will then slow things down and turn things toward, all right, let's go into this, this, or that. So thank you. Uh, and Mark, you, uh, Mark Carranza, <clears throat> you have the con. Quickly, um, for people who are joining late, is there a way to have a, um, I guess on the Mattermost or someplace that's shared, um, the topic so I can check it before um, uh, and don't have to ask this question. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Mark, great question. I wish there was a, an arrival banner that hosts could could write up so that for any particular Zoom call, when a new entrant showed up, you could show them, hey, this is this and this is what we're doing, but there isn't such a thing. Um, we uh, in the chat, but you don't get to see the chat uh, from the beginning before you show up into the call. Yeah, or a sticky uh, sticky chat, exactly. Um, and the idea of putting it in the uh, Mattermost channel is good too, although I don't think all of us check the Mattermost or are really participating that much on the Mattermost. Putting it there is good. Um, 
we could have a, a simple web page. And what I'm going to do is create uh, wiki pages for each of these protocols um, so that then there would be a one, a single URL for that explanation. That could work too, Pete. Um, so like that. Uh, Zoom's whiteboard. This is that's like the cone of silence, Ken. <laughs> and I believe Mark is uh, complete. So Doug, um, it's off. Okay, to you. so I'm. I'll like treat you. this as my first check-in. Uh, and so stuff that's on my mind, well, I just got back from this trip to, to Malaysia and Borneo, uh, where the jungles are filled with orcas and not tigers. It was an amazing trip. Um, I also, two weeks ago, just published my book called Garden World Politics, which is at Amazon. And uh, it, it was an amazing relief to get it out. Uh, and I've already drafted a second book called Thinking Thinking. And the mm. idea is that we cannot solve climate change with the way that we're thinking. We need an alternative way. And so in the history of Western and Eastern civilization, have there been possible ways of developing our thinking that we haven't exploited yet that actually could cope? And I think that materialism builds up a world from the bottom up uh, and never quite gets up very far. Uh, so can it be turned around and say, for example, that the universe is consciousness and our little consciousness is a moment every now and then where we break into that bigger consciousness. And the question is, what does the earth look like from that bigger consciousness? Uh, so that's been, been fun. Um, I'm also struck by the fact that the paralysis that we feel has a kind of freedom in it. Uh, we don't have to do anything right. Uh, and that it's, a, uh, Napoleon once said, it's urgent to wait. And maybe that's where we are. End of uh, check-in. Now gear up. So um, what's living for me is actually the circle up that uh, Gil and Ken did yesterday at, around the meme of trust. And, um, and trust for me is sort of loaded because um, <laughs> You don't have the concept of trust without the concept of distrust. It, it sort of requires that duality and um, carries with it a basis or rationalization for, for shifting into blame. Um, and um, so I sort of, and, and ultimately it's rooted in fear, which is, you know, uh, the concept of trust being broken um, and failing. So um, I was a bit challenged by that as the as the the the, the source soil for it. But what I what I noticed came out of it in the breakout rooms was in asking the question, have you, you know, did you experience a breach of trust in your life? Like, what was that about? And what emerged um, in terms of the value and the gold wasn't about trust, but it was in people sharing those experiences, the sort of cathartic shifting into feeling and also connection by and between the people sharing with each other. And so people came out um, sharing more about that, um, the commonality connections, um, than thematically about 
the concept of trust itself. And, um, and that was sort of living for me because it's in, in, in my frame and orientation, um, the, the inquiry and the center is, is about connection and disconnection. And um, and how can connection be provoked, catalyzed, increased by in between? Because out of that um, comes sort of awareness, care, empathy, all of the juicy stuff. Um, and and when that's underlying and aggregated, it generates movement. It generates action. It generates collective response. Um, so, so that's sort of center of focus is living for me. Um, just as an aside, um, focusing on what if we don't make it ultimately ends up in the same place in my mind, which is, are, are we going to be any more consequential going down that rabbit hole in addressing what to do in the in the event of than we have been in avoiding that. I'm not sure it's not in the inquiry, same old, same old, in mapping to how do we change or affect course. So, um, and I think that's it for me, I'm complete. So let me um, offer a, a check-in and a response if that's kosher under whichever protocol we're operating in here. Um, um, Doug, your quote, of, uh, Doug C., your quote of Napoleon of it's urgent to wait. Um, uh, um, what's the word? Feels like a very welcome interpretation of the mood that I'm in these days. Um, I've been um, um, challenged uh, by um, dealing effectively with all the balls that I have in the air, kind of frustrated at the pace of my pace of movement on projects. Uh, and my coach on Monday said to me, um, well, what if you took the thing that you think is the most important and just put it down for 90 days? And before I could even think of res of response, my body just relaxed. I just felt the truth of that. And I've now done that <clears throat> uh, and been kind of perplexed by it. I'm wondering if it's the right thing to do or whatever, but Napoleon, thank you, Napoleon. Yeah, it's for me, it's urgent to wait. Um, and uh, it relates to the question of what if we don't make it because uh, he was saying that in the heat of battle and conquest and so forth. Uh, and the notion of going, of, of, of waiting, of being patient in the face of utter urgency uh, uh, when everybody is panicking, um, it's a pretty important one. I have a friend who's an emergency responder, uh, uh, former firefighter, firefighter executive, whatever they call the, the folks in leadership in the firefighting game. Um, and we probably may have talked about this before in OGM, but uh, one of the things he shared is that uh, when the folks are up um, in, in, in the um, timber of California fighting the you know, the, the, the fire, the, 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 the forest fires uh, on incredibly long shifts without rest and so forth. When, when teams finally take a break and go back to camp for their few hours of rest, they take time to carefully, properly stow all their gear. They don't just like collapse in exhaustion and deal with it later. Everything is put away, cleaned up, hoses are coiled. Um, you know, the, there's a patience in the face of the urgency um, that something worth us considering. And so um, um, I think about that when I think about a conversation about not making it. And also that um, it's one of those places where that calls for a mirror conversation, um, which is what are we doing that's working and what's working well? 
Uh, and, um, you know, the media is not attuned to that conversation. The media is attuned to the police that leads. Uh, but, you know, I would say that despite all, not to disagree at all with what Doug and Klaus and others are saying about the looming disasters, there's also incredible progress in all sorts of ways and all sorts of places at all sorts of levels. So I don't know if those conversations should happen separately um, or together, but I'm, I, I feel a call to both of those. Um, last, um, um, Doug B, thank you for what you said about trust. Um, um, I have a different interpretation about it than you do. Um, um, so I, I would just, you know, so I guess part of my interpretation is what you described about what trust is, is an interpretation of what trust is. Uh, not a definition, but, and, and thank you for that. But you did call forth something that I didn't quite realize happened yesterday, which is that trust grew in the course of that hour and a half of these, you know, 20 or 40 people that were there. And it may, and it may be grew because of what you said about connection and sharing and intimacy. Uh, <laughs> Um, but something, you know, I, I can't, I don't know if this was in your mind, but it wasn't in my mind going into that, that we would actually grow trust in the course of the conversation about trust. And that's kind of interesting. I'm complete. It was very much in my mind, Gil. <laughs> well, I figured you're way smarter than me about these things. Yeah. Thanks, Gil. Um, I, I agree. I think there's very much, um, an opportunity to blend the kind of conversations that Doug and Klaus want to have in a way that keeps that hope in there and that also offers an opportunity to build connection and trust because that's what I think these kinds of calls do. Um, so as my check-in, <clears throat> one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, which I always think about, is how People's, people's actions don't always reflect the values they say they want to put forward. And um, it was interesting because I heard that in a conversation the other day, and I'm going to give credit to Kim Wright, but it came to me by way of telephone that she said it. Um, but I'm always thinking how like all of us, and that goes for everybody in this room, whether we like it or not. We've been um, conditioned, you know, under capitalism. And what I notice is that when we think of solutions, we're still in that sort of paradigm and how that affects us. And I know for me personally, when I'm in certain spaces, not necessarily here, but spaces that even come together where they talk more about being drawn together because of spiritual reasons, the work they do their motivation is still being drawn from that capitalist kind of paradigm. And I noticed myself, I am hesitant to kind of point it out, well, wait a minute, let's stay where we are. Because it's very hard to be the one saying, wait a minute, we're doing that old thing again. And what I'm trying to say in a very roundabout way is, the more we have these conversations, and now I'm talking about a conversation that might take what Doug wants to talk about, what Klaus wants to talk about, bring it together in terms of, so what would we do? It's the end. What are we gonna do? Having all these different ideas in a hypothetical space allows for a lot of A lot of imagining and a lot of re-putting things together in different ways without the emotional blocks that sometimes keep us from speaking out. And I know I'm all over the place with this and maybe somebody that knows what I'm trying to say can state it better, feel free, I won't take offense. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to be in a space where we could hear ideas about how we could do things better. And just real quickly, Klaus had mentioned, you know, these people in these corporations, they know what to do, they're just not doing it. I'd like to hear that conversation with those people in the room. And really, I mean, okay, let me, let me start over. 
what I notice, sometimes even with our own friends, they're doing something, or I'll just ask a question, and I'll leave it at that. What would you do if a friend of yours were working on a project, maybe it was a tech project, and you saw that there was a piece in there that down the road could really have harmful effects? How likely would you mention it? Maybe you had a solution to it. Maybe you had a fix. Maybe you didn't. But how likely would you be to speak that out? And that does tie into trust and different ways of looking at trust. And uh, I'll stop there because mine's more of a thought prompt than anything else. There's an interesting phenomenon in Europe taking place right now. Um, I was listening in to, to some of the German uh, conversations there. And the reason is that the Ukraine war just keeps accelerating. I mean, Russia, Russia is just not backing off and they're pouring hundreds of thousands of people into this fight, even so it's referred to as a meat grinder. You know, for the last 10 days, Russia has lost something like 850 people a day. But the European Union is running out of ammunition. You know, they have pretty much shut, shut off all the stockpiles. They have thrown in the entire arsenal. And now the current production of uh, artillery shells, for example, um, the Ukrainians are shooting off an annual supply, uh, an annual production run in about two months. So they that's that's. Uh, um, that can't go on a whole lot longer without um, without some really more dramatic shifts, and it's creating a real soul searching in the Europeans because that threat being posed here, if anything, is now more imminent and more dangerous than it was at the at the start of this conflict. So the Europeans really have to make up their mind, you know, how far they want to go, and it is creating a collective kind of soul searching on how to respond to this, because they will have to mobilize industrial capacity at a scale that will impact the entire economy. It will impact the, 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 um, the mechanics of, of the EU. And that's really uh, maybe what it takes, you know, is to, to see and understand the threat ahead of you, a war we can, we can process, we can understand you know, what, uh, what that looks like. People just can't, you know, you, you see a report that this iceberg is about to collapse and will rise sea levels by 11 feet. It just doesn't, it just doesn't translate, you know, into uh, this imminent threat. It's abstract, it's far removed, uh, it's years in the making. And our, I don't think our brains are designed, you know, to deal with this. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the complexity of, of what, what uh, humanity is doing to the environment, it's at the intellectual level, you know, at the thought leadership level, it's fully understood. It's, it's you know, we're really down to the way we, we can't continue to grow food the way we do because it destroys uh, the, the, the rest of life. Um, it's just, it just hasn't transformed yet you know, and translated yet into a perception, an understanding of crisis you know, that that uh, allows a collective response. So, yeah, you know, and then of course the when the environmental changes, by the time they come, you can't correct them anymore. You know, in a war, you can mobilize and you can you you have you can have a fairly immediate response. Uh, but with the environment, you know, once, uh, I mean, you have glaciers melting. Pakistan, one third of Pakistan was underwater last year because the Himalayan glaciers are melting at such a rapid pace, right? But what if the water is gone? You know, the, the Himalayan glaciers are supporting China, Pakistan, and India with critically important water. 
So what if that runs dry? You have like what three billion people living in that area. So it the 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 the, um, the challenges I had are just stunningly complex. It just really blows my mind to 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 think about it, and I have to be uh, you know, super careful to not um, to not immerse and in, in, into this in a way where it paralyzes me. But so yeah, I mean I don't have any answers, but I'm just saying it's it's uh it's it's the need is to mobilize the collective mind. You know, and with all the technology that we have today, we should be able to do this quite rapidly if the will to do so was 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 available. I'm sorry, I I, I just have a question. Maybe I missed something because I was typing. The technology to move the collective mind? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm referring to information technology. Okay. No, we, we have the capacity to structure information in ways that is compelling, uh, that, that can reach across the, the spiral uh, or the end, uh, and reach people to where they are. You no, know, you can you can frame uh, the issue in ways that becomes context specific. To specific population groups, it's absolutely it's a no brainer, uh, but we are just unwilling to do it. Because I, I just want to add in how important it is for the collective heart to be a part of that, because that's really missing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to agree that it's not a no-brainer either. I mean, we have all kinds of technology, but minds aren't changed by technology. Minds change in some other kind of way than technology. What Mark Krexer talked about earlier about Greta's climate book uh, as a great example of technology and reach and branding and resources, uh, but maybe without a strategy of change of what kind of communication is needed for whom to support them in moving. I think the, the question, the technology is, you know, well, we, we can get into a conversation about social media technology and the impact that's had, that's had. But I think it's a fundamental question of, you know, how do minds change? Um, that is not a no brainer uh, and needs really careful thought and a lot of experimentation because we don't know for sure, but that's part of the question we're in. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody ever makes anybody else's minds change. And yet minds change. Um, uh, one, one great reference on this, uh, great resource on this is um, um, Spinoza Flores Dreyfus's book, um, Disclosing New Worlds. I don't have the full title in front of me, Pete could probably find it in an instant because the subtitle is interesting also. And it very much goes into the question of, uh, of mind change at a business and political and cultural level. Um, so I invite people to have a look at that. Thanks. So collapse would not be an instantaneous event. It would be a process. And in the process of collapse, there would be emergent phenomena. Uh, that's where I think things like Klaus's projects are so important. Uh, so it's a, well, now back to the question of thinking uh, and collective thinking. We think of collective thinking as the sum of our thoughts of individuals coming together. I think that's wrong because it leaves us still with a fragmented world. If we start from the other end, that the parts are the product of the whole, and the, the whole is what we need to be thinking about. We might come to a different place. I don't know, but I, that's my guess. I will point out briefly that we have slipped out of check-in mode into conversational mode. And Doug, the, the pauses were, were, were intentional. We're sort of waiting between uh, between speakers uh, to let things sort of soak in a little bit. But we have to rethink. Um, whether or not I should be managing the queue or anything like that, because we're, we're totally in conversation mode now. And I was trying to bring us back into check-in mode. Yeah, I think there were no hands up. That's why I did that.
Judy, I can't tell if you're just doing a long pause, but you're up. Oh, I didn't realize it was my turn. Apologies. Um, I guess I'm thinking a lot lately about how it is that people connect with other people and, and what that process is and how it moves from superficial to substantial and how it leads to actually thinking about things in different ways. So I'd be interested in exploring that further either today or at another time, because it seems to me that we're all in variable states at any moment in time based on other distractions, other things going on in life. And the ability to discern the inclination, maybe more than the ability, the inclination to discern our state of self-awareness and our state of questioning and our ability to interact, to influence people, and whether we have the responsibility or the opportunity or whatever to influence people, um, I, I would posit is not something that people think about very often, that, that, that we're much more impulsive as a culture, as a humanity. And because of that, we're unable to grapple with big issues because it's so easily dismissed as it's outside my scope. I can't do anything to really help climate change. What difference will it make if I drive my car once a week instead of every day? Um, and so I think there's a feeling of impotence that goes with that in terms of the immersion in the challenges of daily events. And <clears throat> there needs to be, in my mind, some sort of inspirational uplifting occurrence to invite people to be reflective, to, to think beyond the immediacy of, I have to cook dinner because everybody's going to be here in 45 minutes. And I don't know how to address that. I struggle it, with it myself, in fact, in terms of my own levels of distraction at times. But I'd be really interested to dive deeply into that conversation. I'm going to pause for a bit. Thanks. <clears throat> I, uh, I raised my hand uh, just to, to appreciate what an amazing time uh, it is to be alive. It's really remarkable. Thanks. So for some reason, <clears throat> things that occurred 30 years ago keep popping up in my in my consciousness and my this brain, not having an outward brain. And um, so at the same retreat that I did the Beings in Deep Time with Joanna Macy, she was talking about um, facing despair. So, you know, a lot of people were looking at the world and saying it's hopeless. We're all and this is early 90s. You know, it's all all going to go and we're going to be extinct. And so, you know, but if I took you to the river. And I held you underwater, you would very, very quickly find the will to live. You would start to fight. You would not simply go, oh, I'm just going to drown. You know, you would fight back. And climate change and many of the other things that we're facing are Medusa level fears. You look at them and you turn to stone. I'm paralyzed. I don't know what to do. Right. It's an ancient mythic thing we're facing in terms of the energy of it. And somebody once said the time for pessimism is long past. We don't have time to wring our hands and go, oh, woe is me. We have to come together and work. And 
you know, MIT has the Center for Collective Intelligence. I recently watched a very interesting um, talk with uh, uh, Gary Hamill and um, Tom Malone about collective intelligence. And one of the questions was, you know, what do you do when it's very clear that the collective intelligence is available, but there are people in positions of power who refuse to acknowledge it? This was specifically about corporations. Like, what do you do when you know you have a, a CEO or someone in the C-suite who's holding on to an old way of thinking? And he and Malone was very straightforward. He said that that's a definitely thing that definitely something that happens. There are people who they don't want to surrender to a higher, better way of knowing. They want to hold all the power and they can delay collective intelligence for years. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of our uh quote leaders in positions of leadership and governance they are um they don't want to acknowledge that they don't have the answers they don't want to turn it over and say hey you know let's get some really good thinking about this who's who's got some ideas on this because that would mean that they don't know what they're doing and if they don't know what they're doing they would no longer be in power as leaders so um how do we yes that's uh Hamlin's razor, I believe, Mark. Uh, do not ascribe to ignorance what can be explained by evil. It's the other way around, I think. Uh, don't ascribe to evil what can be explained to ignorance. Um, so I've been on fire for 35 years since I started to become aware of what was happening in the world ecologically, since I read Bucky Fuller's Critical Path in 1987. And the need to not act out of urgency, but to sit with my hair on fire to sit with the challenges and to find a way to not be coming out of a place of fear and constriction to stay connected to resources, to keep my mind open and focus on what is possible, what is happening um, that is supportive, that is moving towards that new world that we want to see. And there's a lot of it. And, and the media does a shit job of reporting it. And I think Gil and I talk about moods a lot in the Living Between Worlds calls, and and the media is is responsible. And when I say media, I'm talking about Disney and and Comcast and all these people who have interlocking boards of directors who say this is what we're going to report. Um, they do a really shit job of reminding us that there are amazing things happening all over the world. There are movements. If you've anybody seen Paul Hawkins' Blessed Unrest, with all the the uh, organizations behind him, amazing things happening every single day, but it doesn't get reported. And all we see is Putin and, and, you know, all this shit that's going on that is keeping the Medusa in front of us. It behooves certain people if most of us are paralyzed, <clears throat> but I am not, I have no religion per se. But I trust in evolution. I trust that, that the evolutionary intelligence that 4.2 billion years ago, something on a ball of molten lava surrounded by a toxic cloud of gas came to life and has continued for 4.2 billion years, every single generation, to create everything we see around us, this amazing planet. And to me, that's, that's the higher power that I surrender to. I don't know how to fix things. I do know how to help people talk through difficulty. And I do know that that it is possible for folks to, who are extremely polarized um, to actually confront that and move through it and come to a different understanding and an ability to work together. They don't have to see eye to eye on everything. They just have to have enough of a sense of what we're doing here is important to life. I think it was Golda Meir like 40 years ago who said something to the effect of, if I can't convince Yasser Arafat um, to, to allow me to live, I at least have to convince him to allow my grandchildren to live. I will not forgive myself or him if we let our grandchildren carry this stupid grudge forward and kill each other. And so I think we're all coming to this point of, of you know, what are we going to do? It's really a scary time and, and it's overwhelming um, and it's paralyzing. And yet we can't be paralyzed and we can't rush to action. So it requires a tremendous uh, capability of soul. Um, Rilke's poem, The Winged Energy of Delight, take your well-disciplined strengths and stretch them between two opposing poles because inside the human heart is where God lives and learns. <clears throat> That's what we're called to do right now. We have to, we have to 
as Nietzsche said, we have to become the gods that we've we've killed off because we are now responsible for the future, for the planet, for everything that's alive on it. It's a massive responsibility. I'm certainly not up to it, but I'll take what I have, what comes to me and do whatever I can. And that has to be enough. I cannot afford to let myself become distracted by the naysayers and, and the Medusas out there. I just put one foot in front of the other and meet meet people and say hello and and try and find a way to to connect so that we can do something together that's useful. I am complete. Um, thank you, John and everybody. Uh, I actually sort of want to check in, and I made a couple of notes for myself in the chat. Um, so I just want to mention uh, multiple things. Uh, the first season of the Tools for Thinking podcast is kind of done, but I've been collecting up summary pages for each of the episodes and finding all the missing parts. And a couple episodes weren't produced yet, and we lost the guy at Betaworks who was doing all the productions. So I'm sort of corralling all that together but expect me to be putting some links into our Mattermost and other places uh, about the series, which was really cool. And it's, it's very much about tools for thinking, but we had uh, a bunch of really fun conversations, useful conversations uh, in there. Um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, I've been doing YouTube shorts just kind of experimentally with no fancy graphics or anything, just me talking head for 60 seconds, hit send, uh, and then weaving those into my brain in different ways. And I'm trying to figure out how they connect into a larger story, because one of the problems with uh, TikTok and YouTube shorts and Instagram reels and all the short media is that they don't, they, they're not nuggets that are easily, that many people are weaving into narratives, never mind uh, larger points of view or anything like that. And I think that those things are actually, I think that these shorts are actually lovely tools for weaving larger narratives. And I'm trying to be an exemplar of that. Um, I've got a page I'll share in the chat after I've finished checking in called Bigger Goals, which was my attempt to set bigger goals for me for 2023. And the first one was share stories of what's working, um, which was why I was doing these YouTube shorts. And uh, the place where I focused down narrowly was a thought in my brain uh, called Revitalizing Cities where for many years now, for a couple of decades now, I've been collecting up stories, which are TEDx talks and articles and examples and whatever, of uh, ways in which cities are, are doing cool stuff that's often very grassrootsy. It's, it's seldom top down by the city government. It's often something that just sort of came up in the spirit of storytelling, because I have an amateur theory that uh, when people see stories and then get excited about a story and then request resources because they'd like to try to do the thing that they heard in the story, that that is a really interesting model for progress. Uh, and so um, I also created a page called What Multiplayer Sense Making Needs because I'm about these this, this shared memory uh, and my bigger goals are trying to match up with what the multiplayer sense making needs are from my perception, all comments welcome. Uh, this month's task is to create shared notes with other people. Um, so anybody who'd like to share notes with me technologically through whatever note-taking system you have, uh, ping me any way you like. Uh, say so in the chat or, or whatever else, but um, be really excited about that. And then I realized when I'd made that list some time ago in the, in the chat here that um, the things that I'm talking about are intended to help dissolve problems in climate change and so forth. And I realized also that um, I'm, I'm mesmerized uh, dreadfully by the Ukraine situation. I really feel a lot of empathy for Ukraine. Uh, small side note, my grand, my maternal grandfather was born in Chernovitz, which is northeast of, of Kiev. Uh, <laughs> so I've, some, of, some of my DNA traces its way back there as well. Um, <laughs> But I'm realizing that um, the kind of mobilization that Greta Thunberg is looking for on climate change is the kind of mobilization we're now realizing we need to make for the war to get um, arms makers back on a war footing to take down Russia. And it's like, wow, those two things are exactly opposite. 
Uh, we need to destroy more of the earth and put more pollutants into the earth and create more uh, weapons of devastation just to get the waters calm enough to maybe collaborate together to solve this other godforsaken crisis, which we're busy not looking at. And so part of the reason I do, I care a lot about sense making and trust between people is that we are now medusid, we are immobilized, not because yes, because these are hyper objects, these are problems, you know, uh, wicked problems, they look too big to solve, but also mostly because we are very intentionally manipulated against one another. And we are being pitted uh, in a battle over power over the joystick in the cockpit. Uh, we, be, we are being intentionally pitted against one another. And the way you pit people against one another is you get them to buy narratives. That's it. Narratives are the weapon. And QAnon is a narrative. It's 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 a narrative, and a whole mess of people and whole mess of people bought that narrative and and you know went out and did stuff in the world that I'm not thrilled about. Uh, and there's a bunch of other narratives like that. Uh, the Great Replacement Theory is a narrative. There's a, a whole set of these narratives that are fueling and unfortunately arming a lot of people uh, into this immobilization spot. And I'm very interested in how we dissolve the immobilization. And the reason I tell tiny stories, 60 second stories about things that work that might bring citizens together to create an edible landscape, uh, like the city of Todd Morden did in the UK, which is one of my favorite TEDx talks, is that I have a feeling that if people knew each other better, they would stop fearing each other. And if they got together over making food and putting food plants around their city, they could ignore political boundaries, you're red and I'm blue, uh, and sort of get to the work of doing stuff together. And if we don't do that, even at a small scale, we stand no chance uh, in face of the larger disasters that are happening. And then last thought by means of check-in is a bit of a reply to earlier, which is, I think the way we fail is only catastrophic if we manage to wipe out major food systems. So we kill off the oceans as a as a food generating engine, and we've we've wiped out most of humanity. There there won't be that many people who manage to survive a complete loss of the food uh, failure of the food system. But otherwise, that failure is very lumpy. The privileged people get to go, you know, uh, get eaten by a bronto rock, as Meryl Streep did, uh, and don't look up. Uh, you know, they get to get off the planet or whatever. I don't know, but but. The failure then is clumsy and slow, and, and humans are insanely adaptable. That's one of our benefits and one of our, um, yes, Pam Warhurst is exactly the talk, Ken, thank you. Um, one of our great benefits is how adaptive humans are, and one of our great weaknesses is how adaptive we are, because we have no memory unless we keep telling the stories of what happened, which is what song lines are which is well, how Germany deals with the, the, the Holocaust. They tell the stories over and over again, and still Germany has this gigantic far right movement that just keeps ballooning. It's like we can't, and, and I refuse to believe that humans are just nasty and violent, and that's just our fate, and we should just arm up and defend ourselves better against the nasty people on the other side of the, of the river. Um, sorry for the very long check-in, but all these things are burbling around in my head. I am complete. Jerry, I see that your hand is still up. Is there a silence that you are trying to invite in? I want to honor it if so. Um, there was a forgetfulness that I had invited in <laughs> unintentionally. Perfect. I uh, I noticed if Mark is still here, I noticed that Mark has a green when he when your box popped up, Mark. I saw the green check mark, and I wanted to make space for you to check in before I before I reshared or shared again. Thank you, Patty. Yeah. I am still preparing. You're perfectly in line. Go for it. I will invite in a moment of silence first. Really been enjoying what's being shared. Um, there's been a lot coming up for. No, nope, hold on. There's a been a lot coming up for me in the sharing that that feels like it ties it very much into what I am exploring um, 
in my own curiosity and in my own uh, my own space. Um, I, I continue to come back to this idea of um, collective emotional maturity, and it, it's um, I think what that means to me when I think of emotional maturity in, in one human, I I see that as one's ability to hold, among many other things, to hold um, the possibility for a narrative that is not black and white, but holds the complexity and the nuance of um, both sides. Um, I, I see that as the ability to um, experience and to feel and be present with um, difficult, challenging, we'll call them emotional experiences while still um, remaining in what some call like the window of tolerance or being able to um, keep one's nervous system safe and um, open. Um, I see that as the ability to communicate clearly and to be connected with one's needs and um, to be able to articulate and advocate for those needs in a timely and appropriate manner, among other things. These are just a few facets of how I understand and what I understand emotional maturity to be. And I think when, as, as we've been in discussion, what keeps coming up for me is this other, I don't hear people thinking about this or talking about this, and it could just be the sample size of the people that I, you know, interact with. But um, I, I continue to hear this idea when we talk about the experience of um, the emotional experience being one that like, oh, like it's not a formula, you know, like, oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, when, when we are holding space for someone else, or we're engaging with someone else, you know, the experience of emotion, it can't be, um, it's not rigid, we're in flow with this other thing. And it's not, there's no pattern, there's no formula available. And I think I'm part of what I'm engaging with is, is um, I'm moving forward and challenge to that idea. And I, I, I suspect that there might be the possibility of emotional experience um, very possibly having um, the ability to be held in formula or pattern. And I, I suspect that there, um, you know, I think I once on this call, I, I referred to as emotional physics or power physics. I, I just see time and time again, it seems that there are pretty predictable ways that humans tend to cope, deal, or lack thereof um, with emotional experiences given the resources that they do or do not have. And as I'm hearing elements of this conversation about, you know, something I heard Klaus say earlier was, you know, there's there's a lot of people who seem to understand the implications of what, what is coming and where we're headed and are unwilling to do anything. And I think the way through through this lens that I'm I'm trying to understand, I, I I also see it as they're unable to do anything, actually unable. And and from unable, I mean not that they can't raise their hand and move the thing to make the change, but unable in the sense that they they might not actually have enough um, inner resource to keep their body in a in a felt sense of um, safety, right? And whatever that that um, definition of safety means to that that human body, and in that way, there there is perhaps a true inability to act because I do think, and it's, it's my lens and my belief that we are only able to um, act as far as our nervous system can cope and handle and still perceive us to be maintaining safety, right? And so is what's coming up for me is what is keeping us locked in this sense of paralysis and is kind of saying this Medusa level fear, merely an inability to um, we just haven't, you know, evolved. We haven't had enough time and awareness to evolve our human physical, collective human physical body into a space where we are able to navigate these situations with the emotional maturity said differently, you know, nervous system tolerance needed to act. Um, and so I think when Judith was sharing that she suspects that, you know, what, what would be a really powerful and um, impactful collective experience to have at this time is is one of deep inspiration. If we were able to, if we were modeled or if we were shown or told a narrative that was able to galvanize and inspire us towards movement and towards um, we we'll call it like productive, productive action. And I and I think until our, this is my my suspicion, until our collective places greater value in the story, the narrative of personal empowerment. Um, and rather than the victim narrative, like I, I don't, I don't sense that that shining moment of inspiration really holding much power for what Jerry was saying around 
um, you know, we are sold narratives and it's the narratives that, you know, it's, it's kind of up to us to, you didn't say this, Jerry, but I understood it's up to us to kind of, um, sort through those narratives and even to recognize that we're being sold or, you know, told narratives, right. And what we do with that is, is our, is our choice. But I think, um, what that brings up for me is I'm, I've recently been working with, um, clients one-on-one -on -one and, you know, I'm working as a coach. And so we're, as I'm engaging with people who it, it very, seems very clear to me, they're still in victim, you know, in victim mentality. You know, there's the question like, man, like, how do you support someone in remembering their power? How do you support someone in, in, in moving out of victimhood or the victim mindset? And I just heard this was like two days ago. I just heard it was I was listening to um, I think it was a podcast interview with a therapist who said the most important part, one of the most important parts of supporting someone and moving out of that direction is you first have to acknowledge that they were at one time they were they were very they were, they were a victim in childhood. You know, if you know, you were at home and you couldn't leave the situation where your parents were, you know, doing fighting, whatever, like you were a victim at that time. But it was really interesting to, to hear her suggest that first, there has to be an external acknowledgement to someone that, yes, you were a victim before they can remember that, like, oh, that that was that was true for me at that time. I'm, am I still there? Am I still am I still a victim? And an encouraging direction, exploration, that direction I just had never heard that before. And so as 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 we're in this conversation, I'm I'm curious about the collective. Um, you know, I think a lot of people unfortunately do feel that impotence and that how easy it may feel to um be a victim. And I I don't love that word here. I I I suspect there's more appropriate language for that, but just for for our sake, I, I trust, you know, we understand what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, how how do we encourage how do we get to a place where we're able to remember and consider and hold the possibility that we have power in my life in my you know in in my existence that i am able to um affect change and that what i who i am and what i do does matter i think i feel complete with that that's, that's what came up in the sharing thank you